In this session, I'd like to talk a little bit about the numbers in the spreadsheet. When you look at a company, one of the key questions you need to answer is, is my company creating value? Now, your first reaction is, what does that mean, creating value? Making money in a company is good. It's better than losing money, but making money might not be enough, and here's why. You have capital invested in that company, and that capital could be invested elsewhere and make a reasonable return. So to create value, you have to make more money than the next best alternative. So if you look at a business to measure value creation, you need to measure three things. The first is, how much money is my company making? The earnings or profits of the company. The second is, how much capital do I have invested in this company? And the third is, what rate of return can I make on this capital if I invested it elsewhere in investments of equivalent risk? Earnings, invested capital, and getting a hurdle rate. That should be easy enough to do, right? But it's easier said than done because measuring excess returns is really tough to do. In a perfect world, here's how you do it. You would use expected earnings and cash flows because after all, the value of an investment comes from what it does in the future, not what it's done in the past. For invested capital, you would actually have a measure of inflation-adjusted capital invested in existing assets. So if you invested in land in 1963, obviously what you invest in 1963 should not be on your balance sheet. It's what the inflation-adjusted value of that number is. Not market value, but the actual capital invested in existing assets. And third, for a hurdle rate, you'd like to know what you would make on investments of equivalent risk out there today. So it's got to be current. It's got to adjust for risk. And if you're a company in many businesses, then I need to reflect the weights of these businesses. And if you're a company that operates in many countries, the weights of these countries, that's quite a tall order. But that's what we try to do when we're trying to do an intrinsic valuation of an individual company. In this spreadsheet, though, I'm trying to do this for 42,000 plus companies. It's going to be impossible to get these kinds of inputs for the companies so I'm going to make some approximations. To measure how much in the company is making, I have to trust accounting earnings. And to come up with cost of equity and cost of capital, I've got to cut some corners. Let me first set up the how we're going to compute whether a company is creating value. And I'm going to argue the way you compute excess value is going to depend on whose eyes you look at through the company. You're saying, what do you mean? Well, you could look at a company through the eyes of the equity investors in the company, or you could look at the entire company. If you're looking at things through the eyes of the equity investor, here's the question you're asking. Is the equity income cash flow I'm making greater than my cost of equity? If you're looking at it from the perspective of the whole business, the question you're asking is a little broader. Is the overall return I'm making on this company greater than the cost of capital from both equity and debt in this company? Now, as I said, it's easier said than done. So the simplest way in which you can do this for lots of companies is to trust accounting returns. To measure returns to equity investors, I'm going to look at the return in equity. And I'll go through the, the accounting definition of it and its pluses and minuses. To measure the return I'm making as an overall firm, I'm going to look at the return in capital. So let me take you through the, the estimation choices I had to make to come up with these numbers, at least for the companies that you see in my sample. To compute the return in equity, I used the accounting measure of income to equity investors, which is net income, and I used the net income in the last 12 months. Now, already you can see the limitations of that, right? A company could have had a really good year, a really bad year. An alternative would have been to use an average income over the last 10 years, but that carries a whole other set of problems. So I use the net income from the most recent 12 months. To come up with a measure of the equity invested in existing projects, I use the book value of equity. Now the book value of equity, at least in theory, should reflect all the investments you've made as an equity investor in a company, but it's generally not inflation adjusted and it's affected by counting judgment calls. Things like restructuring charges and screw it up. I use the book value of equity at the start of the most recent year. You divide the net income by the book value of equity, you're getting a rough proxy for what you're making as equity invest in the company. You can already see why it's rough. It uses the last 12 months and it uses an accounting number, but it's a good start. To get to a cost of equity, because I'm doing this across 42,000 plus companies, I had to make some approximations. First, I did everything in US dollars. That's not an approximation. That's just to make sure we're on an even playing field so I can compare these numbers across companies. The risk-free rate I used was therefore the US T-bond rate at the start of the most recent year. To get my beta for the company, 
I used the beta of the business that the company was categorized into. So if you're a multi-business company, that is going to be an approximation. I'm going to use your biggest business as the, to come up with the beta for your company. So the unlevered beta is the unlevered beta of the biggest business you're in. To come up with the leverage effect, I used the debt to equity ratio at the end of the most recent year. I used a market debt to equity ratio, total debt that includes leases and the market value of equity, but it's from the end of the most recent year. Again, that could be skewed by whatever the company did last year. To get an equity risk premium, again, I made an approximation. Rather than try to come up with a weighted average across the multiple countries you're in, which is really, really messy to do if you're doing 43,000 companies, I use the equity risk premium of the country you're headquartered in. As I said, it's an approximation, but with those approximations, I come up with the cost of equity for your company. That cost of equity, of course, when I do cost of capital, get multiplied by the weight of equity, but those are the estimation choices I made for coming up with equity excess returns. To do this for the entire firm, I had to compute a return in invested capital. I'll go, go through the accounting definition, then lead you through how I came up with these numbers. The accounting definition of return on capital is after tax operating income. Why? Because you've got to climb above the interest expense. So it's operating income times one minus the tax rate divided by the book value of invested capital. Book value of invested capital is book value of equity plus book value of debt minus cash. So I'll take you through how I made those choices. To come up with my operating income, I used the operating income in the most recent 12 months, the earnings before interest and taxes. Again, trailing 12-month numbers, and that can be skewed by having a good or a bad year. For the tax rate, I used the effective tax rate in the most recent year. Operating income times 1 minus the effective tax rate. Now, in the denominator, here's what I did. I took the book value of equity at the start of the most recent year, and all the caveats I mentioned, the context of return equity applied. I added to that the book value of debt, including lease commitments, and I subtracted out cash and marketable securities. Again, I'm taking the book value of invested capital at the start of the most recent year. You divide the, the after-tax operating by the book value of invested capital, you come up with the return on capital. Now, there are two adjustments I made for all 42,000 plus companies that are going to make my numbers different than what you see in the financials. The first is I capitalize leases for all companies. I've been doing this for a long time, but starting in 2019, accountants might be doing the right thing and joining me in this process, but I capitalize lease commitments. I also treat R&D as a capex, which is what it is, not an operating expense, and I capitalize R&D. So my numbers for both income and invested capital reflect those adjustments that I've made. So that's how I computed the return on capital. To get to the cost of capital, Here's what I did. I started with the cost of equity and I go, went through the estimation choices there. I multiplied the cost of equity by the weight of equity. But to that, I had to bring in a cost of debt. To get a cost of debt, if the company had a bond rating from S&P or Moody's, in this case S&P, I used the S&P bond rating to come up with a default spread that I added to the risk-free rate. If it's a company in a risky country, I added the country default spread as well to the UST bond rate. So I'm coming up with a cost of debt in US dollar terms. If the company did not have a rating, I went through the process of estimating a rating using financial ratios, things like interest coverage ratio. At the end of the process, I had a default spread for the company that I added to the risk-free rate to come up with the cost of debt. I multiplied by the weight of debt. Again, these are market value weights and they reflect what the company was using at the end of the most recent year. And I came up with the cost of capital in US dollar terms. Return on equity, cost of equity, return on capital, cost of capital. I've talked about the process of computing excess returns for individual companies. Let me talk about how in this spreadsheet I compute excess returns by sector. I start with each sector. I look at every company in that sector and I compute an average beta across those companies. That average beta is what I use to compute my cost of equity for the sector. To get a return in equity, I look at the aggregate net income, the sum of the net income of all of the companies in the sector, including money losing companies, and divide by the sum of the book values of equity. So rather than do this for individual companies and average return equity across companies, this is an aggregated return in equity for the entire sector. I subtract my cost of equity for the sector from the aggregate return in equity. I get an excess return, a, a spread, an equity return spread for the entire sector. 
when I multiply that equity return spread by the book value of equity, and again, remember, this is aggregated book value of equity, I come up with the total equity value added during the course of the most recent year. So conditioned on all my numbers still being last the last 12 months, I am getting a measure of the spread that this company earned for equity investors. Now let me move on to the capital side of the equation. To come up with the value created from the perspective of the entire business, again, I start with the cost of capital for each business. If you go to the spreadsheet on cost of capital, I go through this process more fully, but this is a cost of capital of the entire sector, where I use the beta for the sector to come up with the cost of equity, and a cost of debt that I estimate at the sector level to come up with the cost of debt. I use the marginal tax rate of whatever region of the world that the company is in, or the, 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 the particular spreadsheet is about, to come up with an after-tax cost of debt. I take a weighted average. I come up with a cost of capital for the sector. To come up with the return on investment capital for the sector, I use the same aggregated approach I use with the return equity. I look at the total operating income of all companies in that sector, and I multiply by one minus the effective tax rate for companies in the sector. I look at the average effective tax rate. That, that gives me my after-tax operating income for the entire sector. I divide that by the total, the aggregated book value of invested capital, which, just like for an individual company, is book value of equity plus book value of debt minus cash. I get a return on capital for the entire sector. The difference between the return on capital and the cost of capital is the return spread I've computed for the sector. I multiply that by the book value of capital. I come up with an EVA or an economic value added in the most recent 12 months using my numbers. So that's how I compute my excess returns and value added. So take the numbers with a grain of salt because I am using accounting numbers. I'm using the last 12 months. And to that extent, it can be skewed for some sectors and affected by bad years for others. But it is a good metric to use to compare where your company stands relative to the sector. Thank you very much. I hope this is useful.